first is what? So what is PET? So PET is positron emission tomography, beginning with a radioisotope nucleus that emits a positron, that it collides with an electron. Now, positron is actually antimatter. Now, how cool is that? It's antimatter. I just, you know, anyways, it's amazing. And through uh, um, uh, Einstein's laws of uh, physics, they, uh, the two annihilate and emit two photons in equal and opposite direction. And it's this actual beautiful physical principle that allows PET to do what it does. So if we place detectors on opposite sides in a ring, we can precisely localize where the event has occurred between the two because of this coincid these coincidence photons. And it's this that gives, allows us to measure and track molecular function processes at a picomolar level, uh, gives us superior functional accuracy that allows biological quantification and that leads to the diagnostic and prognostic value of PET. So we're moving now to look, talking about viability and hibernation. And what we're talking about is dysfunctional myocardium. Um, and what we're trying to do is, in the dysfunctional myocardium, distinguish viable, recoverable myocardium from non-viable scar. Viable myocardium can be remodeled or no and normal. It can be stunned um, uh, or it can be hibernating. And it's the hibernating tissue that's most relevant for us in terms of improvement of function and, um, and outcomes. Uh, so here's an example of a patient with a perfusion, large perfusion defect in the anterior wall and inferior wall, but with maintained FDG activity. And this is so-called perfusion metabolism mismatch and is an indicator of myocardial hibernation. On the other hand, this patient has uh, significant reduced perfusion that's matched with FDG uptake indicating myocardial scar. Um, this patient would be expected to have improvement in function and potentially outcome, and this patient uh, would not. So we did a, a trial um, um, uh, that we published in 2007, uh, and then a follow-up of that um, uh, a little bit later, where we compared FTG PET uh, imaging being done in patients to not being done and use that to try to direct therapy. And what we showed was that there was a trend for outcome benefit when PET was used, but it did not reach statistical significance. So it was a negative trial overall. However, about 25% of the patients did not adhere to the recommendations that the imaging provided. So if we suggested to revascularize, the, the, the physician and patient did not undergo revascularization. And if we suggested not to, they sometimes did. When we considered that in a post hoc analysis, uh, we actually were able to demonstrate that there was outcome benefit, um, suggesting that you can get significant benefit when you adhere to the imaging recommendations. Of course, you do have to take into account the entire clinical picture. So this is a rubidium generator, and the green dot indicates the rubidium, which passes into the right ventricle. We see the right ventricular blood pool passes through the lung uh, and into the left ventricle, we see the left ventricular blood pool. Then it's gradually taken up by the myocardium and washes out from the blood. So the myocardium is shown, a time activity sure is, is shown in blue, and the blood pool is shown in red. So we then take this data. Now, this, this type of image here, this is what static imaging with, with SPECT or PET uses, the late uptake images. Um, and this is that whereas, whereas flow, all of the action is in the first uh, several minutes. So what happens here is we take this and we apply a mathematical model that looks at the blood and the tissue. And we look at, uh, with this, we use the mathematical modeling to create what is the true myocardial curve, uptake curve. And we can, from this, we can determine the rate constant for its uptake from the blood into the tissue, the K1 which we know relates to flow and extraction. And from this, we can calculate myocardial blood flow. <clears throat> so how does it compare? So the Pacific trial compared PET, SPECT, um, uh, and CTA to, to each other and looked at the functional significance based on invasive angiography. And PET was the most accurate among these tests. They further looked at uh, patients who had uh, um, CTFFR and we're able to show that uh, when you look at the patient as a whole, that PET was the most accurate method for detecting disease. So who? 
who should get FDG PET imaging. So the Heart Rhythm Society guidelines recommend that the, the following, in the following scenarios, that when you're screening for young patients under the age of 60, and I think they're extending that to 70, 60 is, is pretty young, I think. Um, uh, in any event, the, the, that FTG PET is, is, um, uh, should be a first line test. When you're screening for cardiac involvement, if someone has an abnormal echo or ab abnormal uh, Holter or something like that, or symptoms, then MRI would be the first test to use. When you're following responses to steroids and other immunosuppressive therapy, FDG PET, and they also recommend FDG when there's active disease in patients with manifest uh, cardiac sarcoid where there's vent increased ventricular arrhythmia burden. So FDG PET is highly sensitive for hibernating myocardium. It's best used in high-risk patients with, re with reduced ejection fraction where decisions are most difficult. PET flow is, has provide accurate prognostic um, uh, information that defines a spectrum of disease of obstructive to microvascular dysfunction. For sarcoid, FGPET is considered first line in young patients with high grade AV block and is the test recommended for follow up. Um, it provides helpful diagnosis and prognosis for prosthetic valve endocarditis and device infection. It's less sensitive but still valuable in native valve endocarditis. Um, it reflects inflammation and atherosclerosis, which has prognostic value and may be a target for other novel anti-inflammatory therapies.